Hello. Today's episode of Beyond Distribution with GTDC features our guest, David Grant, who joined Westcon Comstore in 2008 and has been serving as CEO since early 2020. David shares his thoughts with Frank on how Westcon Comstore is delivering value in key areas such as networking, cybersecurity, enabling solution providers in the next wave of digital transformation, and potential M&A opportunities in Europe and APAC. If you're enjoying our podcasts, please don't forget to rate and like. Thanks and enjoy this episode. All right, well, welcome everybody. I'm Frank Vitagliano and we're doing our uh, Beyond the Distribution podcast. And I'm delighted to have with me today, David Grant, CEO of Westcon Comstore. David, nice to have you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, delighted to be here. Yeah, Lo lovely, excellent. Lovely setting. Uh, yes, it is, and the weather's beautiful, and uh, you know, we bo both would probably rather be playing golf right now, but we're going to do this. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, so tell me a little bit about yourself, uh, you know, your, how'd you get your start in the IT industry, and you know, yeah. right up to the role you have today. So I've, you know, based in the UK, and uh, have been, even when I've been doing global roles, but uh, started out at, uh, at Canon, mm. uh, was there 14 years in primarily direct sales, marketing, acquisitions, and, uh, and then moved into to channels. And, and that was what uh, led me to move into distribution mm. uh, many years ago with a small UK private equity backed business called Crane that was then subsequently acquired by, by Westcon. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and, and here I am today. Yeah, so you started on the vendor side. Interesting. I did, yeah. yeah. But yeah. It's, uh, not, not sure that Canon would be uh, seen as quite high tech as some of the, the vendors we work with now, but it was certainly uh, a, a lot of the a lot of the drivers are exactly the same. Totally. I mean, tell tell me about it. I started at you know IBM 40 years ago, and yeah. so that you know wasn't wasn't <laughs> there either, <laughs> particularly on the PC side. So David, you assumed the president, the CEO title at um, uh, at Westcon right at the beginning of 2020. That's right. Okay. Which was an interesting time. Yeah, very. <laughs> Talk a yeah. little bit about that. So I've been working with my team for, for three years previously, so we all knew each other. But when uh, when you take over as CEO, there's always that feeling that you've got to you know, get out and do a, a tour of duty. And of course, all of that was done virtually. Yeah. Um, yeah. And of course, again, we were used to doing an awful lot of, like many distributors, a lot of field work and had to move it all, uh, all to internal. Yeah. Uh, so there was a lot of anxiety about what impact that would really have on the relationships with partners, our ability to, to really run the business. Yep. We were very fortunate. We, we moved all 3,000 of our employees uh, to working remotely, working from home within two days. Wow. So from a uh, you know, business continuity perspective, uh, our CIO and the teams there did a fantastic job. So that was the biggest anxiety about how we stay connected, yeah. Um, yeah. both internally with the teams and also, of course, with the partners. As it transpired, uh, of course, everyone was in the same boat, yeah. And yeah. Uh, business was uh, it, it was uh, actually a quite a quite a galvanising period. It, it was. It, I tell you, you know, for someone who's been associated for a lot of years with distribution, yep. you know, from the vendor side, um, and used to walking in the rooms with full of people yep. doing sales, and to take that and move that overnight. And you know, be up and running, and and supporting the both the vendor community and the and your customers yeah. um, was an amazing task. Yeah. Was an, and then, and to top it all off, you also had to worry about your logistical folks who had to be physically Absolutely. there, right? Yeah. So, so we um, in Europe we were uh, supplying a lot of the um, NHS and frontline hospitals yeah. with uh, with the equipment as they were starting to build out those facilities. Um, and therefore, we had uh, all of our warehouses and uh, those logistics teams running, you know, all the time. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you know, they were they were more exposed, I suppose, than, than many of the rest of us. Did a fantastic job. Yeah, it, that, it's amazing. So, and I got to tell you, one of the things that um, I saw sometime in mid 21 mm -hmm. was a report that Context uh, had done, which was a satisfaction report. Uh, by the vendors and the solution providers yeah. on the satisfaction over the a year's period of time yeah. with distribution. And it was up in every category, <laughs> right? And so yeah. I, I think the marketplace really understood, you know, the, the length that you guys went to and how quickly you were able to, to do that. Yeah, no, right? I, it was, uh, well, you know, look, looking back, um, we learned a huge amount our business, about the business. And, uh, you know, of course, it, it challenged so many of the, 
the long-held beliefs about how we should run the business and yeah. how we needed to uh, uh, I suppose interact with partners. One of the things we found was actually when we were working with vendors doing QBRs or looking for winning RFPs, uh, you know, previously, if someone said, "Well, there's a there's an event in Australia, David," you know, would, would I go for one event in Australia? Yeah. No, right. and people previously would never have considered having video links as a routine. Right. But you could bring your A team to every single meeting. Totally, totally. It's and, changed uh, the game, and it and it, uh, it made a big difference. Yeah. No, that's great. That's great. And I think we learned we've learned a lot yeah. coming through it. And um, the thing that I would tell you that I've experienced. Personally, and I, you know, and when I took this role in 2019, there was a lot of nonsense and debate about, you know, the future of distribution mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, as as subscription models and cloud, yeah. and you know, the real value and, you know, w how distribution is going to survive that as hardware transitioned out. Yeah. Boy, that's all gone away. Yeah. All that noise is, is gone away yeah. because of the role and the job that you guys all did, you know through the pandemic and and I think uh, as as importantly in the the new model of you know device and subscription subscription only uh, the orchestration the aggregation is much more complex than just shipping a device totally and the uh, so the, the activities that we need to undertake around channel education and enablement are exactly the same irrelevant of the delivery method right Right. Uh, but when it comes to the or uh, orchestration of shipping a device, associating it with, with software and a serial number, mm -hmm. driving the, making sure that there's the adoption, looking at how do you cross-sell and upsell, and how do you then drive the subscription resigning or the renewal, all of those, uh, all of those components are, you know, I think, uh, most effectively undertaken in distribution. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So. Um, Obviously, there's been a lot of positive change, yeah. but we're also dealing right now in a pretty uncertain, maybe unstable, you yeah. know, economic yeah, environment. Sure. What? Yeah. How are you feeling about that? What are you seeing, particularly being based in, you know, Europe? Europe. Yeah. So, firstly, I, I think, uh, you know, most recently, there is some reprieve or re uh, respite in some of the negativity around uh, economic outlook. I'm yeah. not suggesting it's uh, it's not going to be tough. But the, um, the last three years, you know, going through the pandemic, um, most CIOs, most organizations have realized that it was their investments in technology that helped them stay productive and work yep. through the, uh, the tough periods. Um, so I don't think that as businesses start to see perhaps some contraction, that the IT budgets are gonna be cut quite as quickly as they would have done previously. So that, yeah. that's one factor. Um, do, what, what are the challenges? I think the skills shortage that we see in the channel mm. uh, is going to continue for some time. Mm. Uh, you know, we do, uh, globally we invest as often as possible in um, apprentice programs, bringing uh, young people into the business to help develop them through, particularly in technical roles. Uh, but there is clearly a, a skills shortage, um, and there doesn't appear to be, as of yet, a complete end to the supply chain disruptions and. Uh, uh, product availability and I think that will continue to rumble on for another 12 to 18 months. Yeah, it seems like it. Um, one of the things that's I think very interesting that I've looked at recently is the overall outlook mm. for, you know, the IT space is you know, f between 4 and 5 percent most people would, would, yeah. would indicate. Yeah. But what's really interesting is a huge disparity between sort of endpoint solutions kind of mm -hmm. product, you know, PCs, peripherals, printers, mm -hmm. and you know, the more the enterprise related things, st yeah. storage, networking, and yeah. in areas that you play in. Well, I think where, where we are, and, you know, our main areas of focus are networking and cybersecurity. Right. And if you look at uh, the drive from hybrid working, uh, organizations looking to consolidate premise footprint, yep. that's driving a significant uh, refresh in the networking arena. And of course, I would say that uh, top of every CIO's agenda at the moment is, is what's your security posture. Totally. Uh, given the geopolitical dynamic, particularly in Europe, uh, but actually I, I think whether it's, uh, no matter where you think your, uh, you know, your bad actors are gonna come from, yeah. everyone needs to be protected. So yeah. we, we, see, um, we see continued growth for, you know, certainly from our, going into our new financial year, see continued positive growth 
Yeah, and, and, and the other piece is obviously the work from home piece and the security 100%. requirements around work from home. Yeah. Those are amazing. Yeah, right? you, you know, you've, you're working with, you were in the premise, you know, in your office, at home, Starbucks, in, in your customer. Right. Absolutely. So um, yeah, ultimately, I think that uh, yeah, that networking and security spaces, uh, yeah, we're, I think we're in a positive position. Yeah. So we've also seen, uh, in a, seeing it increasingly, a shift in distribution from you know what used to be the you know the pick pack and ship kind of days yep. where where there was a ton of value in you know being a bank and a and a warehouse and there's still value in that yeah, for sure. but that's shifting for sure yeah, and yeah, yeah. and so obviously you're right in the middle of that and what are you what are you doing to you know support that and what is your team doing as it relates to that transition if okay. you will so <clears throat> so firstly you're absolutely right that whole logistics supply chain piece remains critical particularly uh, when it relates to global and international deployments that we that we manage uh, quite a significant uh, portion of um, but um, w our business has gone from being 21 percent software and recurring revenues back in 2018 um, this year it'll be just uh, just over 52 percent wow you crossed so, that mark wow so from our perspective um, clearly, a number of our vendors are driving their solutions to be more software-centric, right. right. but our uh, our focus is to go and bring on, on vendors that have got that yeah. Yeah. more software uh, subscription profile, which in the cybersecurity space, of course, is relatively straightforward yeah. uh, in terms of identifying you know, that, that business model. Um, and that's where I come back to the point I made earlier about this, this whole choreography, orchestration right. um, of a device with software or just software subscriptions and you know the sales motion used to be very intuitive mm. you know sales guys and girls would go out they'd, they'd they'd win their order and they'd make a note to call someone back in you know a period of time to yeah. talk about more opportunities but now increasingly that you know the adoption of the software making sure that the licenses you sold are deployed uh, seeing which additional opportunities there are uh, we um, we use a, a we use a lot of the data that we have ourselves. Mm -hmm. We've got incredible connectivity to a number of our core vendors, um, so we get the telemetry on you know not just has the uh, application been deployed, but its use. Um, and from our point of view, giving that information to the partners helps them drive a really time-driven, data-supported sales conversation with their end users. Totally. And, and I think that's a, that's a huge value add. I mean, it's, it's giving them warm business opportunities and leads all the time. Yeah, totally. And that was kind of leading into my next question, which was really tied to the services piece. Yeah. And what types of services are you adding to, you know, your portfolio? Yeah. Because, you know, over time, it's becoming obvious that because of the orchestration requirements, you've got to be able to re react to that and provide yeah. that those incremental yeah. services. Yeah. So, um, providing field-based professional services, if you like, is uh, given the skill shortage, continues to be a, a challenge. Mm. Um, we're spending a lot more time driving from our. Uh, we've got three network operating centres uh, around our uh, geographic footprint. So, actually, finding opportunities and mechanisms to use our remote support has been uh, been really valuable uh, for deployment and also for, for network monitoring and performance. And then finally, for if you would talk about you know, services in the broader context, from a marketing point of view, using, um, using our intelligent demand uh, data sales and marketing programs just, mm. to, just to get uh, real business insights and opportunities for our partners. Mm. It's interesting, you know, you've hit on a number of key points that I've been thinking about. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of them we'll be talking about, you know, at our event here. Yeah. Um, you know, the ecosystem orchestration role mm -hmm. is one that only distributors can do. Absolutely. Nobody else can play that role. No, no, right? absolutely right. And yeah. it's kind of interesting because then you start to wonder, you know, people are, well, we'll explain what an ecosystem is. And, yeah. you know, it's obviously a network of, of suppliers, integrators, etc., all trying to deliver a solution to a customer. Yeah. Who else can play that role? Nobody. Well, no, and you know, um, if you talk to vendors when they have uh, various alliances, increasingly those alliances are now actually they just get them to meet in the channel. Yeah, totally. Um, and uh, that's then down to organisation, you know, distribution organisations like ours, 
just to really understand how the partners can extract maximum value from those uh, yep. combinations of solutions. Yeah, I mean, I had a conversation not long ago with a solution provider, and I spent two years as one, and I was a customer, yep. uh, right? And I had a conversation, and I said, well, how come you just haven't, you know, transitioned everything to a hyperscaler? And, you know, mm -hmm. and he said, well, because somebody has to do the work. Yeah. All that work is still there, and it's yeah. as complex, or in some cases more complex, than it's ever been. Oh, I Somebody's got to do that. I don't think the complexity is going away. No, doesn't no, seem like it. No. Which, which really ties into my next question, which is the technological advances yeah. you know, that we're seeing. And so what are the types of things that you, you, know, you guys do to, to provide support to your customers as it relates to you know, new technologies, training, support, et cetera, because okay. it's happening all the time. So, um, so in terms of you know, technical support, that's both pre and post sales and education. Uh, invariably, when we look at a vendor relationship, that's, that's uh, two or three of the, the main component parts. Uh, because if you are responsible for training and educating the channel, invariably you drive a much stronger bond with yep. the organisation. Yep. So that's a, that, yeah, that's that's not you, right. uh, but it but it uh, it works well. Yeah. Um, but I think in terms of the uh, you know the additional value, if you take all of that data driven uh, marketing, the support in identifying opportunities, that's that's all, all a given. But we have a we have a strong uh, group in our vendor management, and also through our uh, customer councils, where we're constantly looking at and getting feedback. Uh, because quite often we get feedback from our partners to say, you know, "Have you looked at, at this this technology or yeah. this vendor?" Yeah. Uh, also, of course, we're not we're not in the U.S., but it's we've got a team who are based on the West Coast, so we can keep an eye on who are the vendors that are looking to you know break into the European markets because invariably that's that's the flow sure you totally. know, get big in the US and then they need to break into a European role and there's a there's a role to be played in taking those next generation solutions uh, into some of our core markets yeah and the whole emerging technology piece from a vendor standpoint yeah. is really critical absolutely because as they're sitting there trying to figure out you know what's my go-to-market strategy um, sometimes they don't quite understand the role distribution can play in in, in supporting that and in, in driving right. that. And I think right? the, and the role is uh, the role is different in different markets around the world. You know, the, the yeah. role of distribution in the U.S. and in Europe, the fundamentals, of course, are the same. Right. But some of the nuances in uh, some of the you know European markets, Asia Pacific, and uh, Middle East and Africa are, are quite different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've got. Quite a, I mean, your business is is, is spread pretty well yeah. am, among those, right? Yeah, so it's you know 20 25 percent of our business is in Asia Pac. Um, got about 15 percent in the Middle East and Africa, and the balance is all in Europe. It's all in Europe, yeah. So that's a, that's an interesting yeah, spread. It is. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Well, um, one of the things that everybody always wants to talk about yeah. is you know what's happening with mergers and acquisitions, mm -hmm. and you know in in North America, of course. There's not, I mean, it's all kind of happened. Yeah, 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 <laughs> you know, yeah. there's not that much left to do. Yeah. I mean, there are some very quality, smaller distributors out there that are kind of niche players, yeah, yeah. But, but a lot of that consolidation's happened. But I think in Europe, it's still pretty spread out, and certainly I would imagine in, in APJ also. Yeah, right? absolutely. So, you know, I think that will, um, I think that will continue. Um, the, uh, I think that the, uh, Things that will drive value have to be the, you know, the ability to continue to execute. A lot of the things I've talked about, in terms of systems, investment, yep. process automation, uh, given the margins that distribution works on, you've got to be able to do that at, at scale. Yep. Uh, so I, um, I do think that there is uh, that continued expectation of uh, acquisitions. Although, again, even in Europe, I think you're starting to see a consolidation of probably a, a few very significant players mm -hmm. and then you get into very small localized players and uh, it's hard to maybe see how that would add to an acquisition strategy overall yeah to a, to a provide you know operational excellence at scale right yeah. but then there's also new technologies um, yeah. you know and different types of technologies that can be added on top of that foundation that's been built. Oh, absolutely. And that I think, becomes uh, important. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. I think to identify 
you know, a specific technology segment or activity that you want to complement and go and buy and then perhaps leverage that out. Right. I certainly think that's a, yeah. a strategy that we'd, uh, we'd consider. Sure, because uh, you can't, because the because they can't build the operational scale no. up because they don't have 30 years, you know, to And it's to sometimes do that. a lot easier just to go and buy the expertise than right. try, and, try and build it, particularly in today's market. Yeah, yeah. Well, good. Well, one last question. Yeah. So, obviously, you know, we've been through a lot. You know, yeah. you started as the CEO in, in, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. We're now, we're, what, two and a half years, you know, almost yeah. three years out. Um, a lot has changed, you know, hybrid work mm -hmm. environment. What are you doing for your company as it relates to that, and how are okay. you how are you guys reacting to that? So I think the first uh, thing that we looked at was that we shouldn't treat all job roles the same. So we've uh, we've differentiated where we believe roles are much more critical to be part of a team, mm -hmm. so primarily when they're customer facing yep. or vendor facing, um, and where those roles require it, we've encouraged people. Um, request to people to be back in somewhere between three and four days a week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it also depends on the uh, on the geography. In some places, four days a week seems to be acceptable. In some places around the world, three days seems a more you know more balanced approach. Yep. Uh, Trying to shy away from you know mandating things because it just uh, just causes unnecessary friction at times. Yeah. Uh, but we've got other roles where, frankly, uh, they are completely effective remotely. Yeah. Sure. Um, so that's how we're approaching it. We're piloting it in uh, all of our markets. We've, uh, we've just done our employee survey um, for 20, uh, 2022. Um, and the feedback we've got is that uh, firstly, 82% of our employees responded, well, which is, which is great. Good. Yeah. Um, even if they want to tell us things that they'd like us to do differently, they care enough to respond. Totally. Which, right. uh, which, is, yeah. which is a big, big help. Yeah. Um, but their feedback around our flexibility uh, and the way in which we're al allowing them to, um, you know, strike a better balance mm -hmm. has been really positive. Mm -hmm. So we th we think we're on the right track. I think that's great. I think I mean I, there's that to deal with, and then there's also the positive aspects of the productivity enhancements yeah. that we clearly have seen. Right. Yeah. I mean because we all remember the days of, you know, getting on a plane and 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 going someplace for a two-hour meeting yeah. with people that we've known forever. Yeah. And now you kind of think about that a little absolutely. bit and say, well, yeah. does that make sense? Right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, productivity is one of our key metrics, and we know that the productivity in our business is going up. Um, we're investing in the technology. We've got great people. Yeah. Um, and as long as those metrics keep going up and to the right, and people are happy, then they'll look after your customers. And it's so a recipe to win. Absolutely. <laughs> this is yeah. great. Well, look, David, I really appreciate you doing this for no, us. Absolute and, pleasure. Uh, Thank it's you. It's good seeing you again, and continued great luck. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.